Hello, my name is Renee Grassi and I'm the Youth Services Manager at Dakota County Library and I'd like to welcome you to tonight's program Life in a Japanese American Incarceration Camp presented by historian and Illinois librarian Sarah Oakner. We would like to begin with Dakota County Library's land acknowledgement. We respectfully acknowledge that Dakota County Library and its nine locations are located on the traditional and ancestral lands of indigenous people. Dakota County resides on land that has been inhabited by the Wapakuti and Miwakatoan Dakota people and other native nations from time immemorial. Seated in a land treaty signed in 1851, this land holds great historical, spiritual, and personal significance for its original stewards, the native nations and peoples of this region. We also want to respectfully acknowledge that Dakota County Library is the namesake of the Dakota people. And by offering this acknowledgement, we work towards our value of acting inclusively and our mission of learning and recognize our collective responsibility to engage our community in the lands of the history of the lands of Indigenous people. Thank you. Tonight's program is part of a series of dedicated programs that uplift diverse Asian American and Pacific Islander experiences and voices. We're glad to have you here tonight as we learn about historical and contemporary personal experiences of being Asian American and Pacific Islander in America and gain an understanding of the ongoing movement for Asian American civil rights and the fight for acceptance and belonging in this country. This program is made, made possible with funds from the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund, which was approved by Minnesota voters in 2008. It is a delight and an honor to welcome and introduce our featured guest tonight, Sarah Oakner. A descendant of internees herself, Sarah Oakner has been studying the internment experience for over 10 years. Her thesis, Relocated Classrooms explore the educational system in the internment camps. She has guest lectured at the University of Illinois and presented at libraries and historical societies throughout the Midwest. Committed to multicultural literature and educational outreach, she's currently a librarian with the Vernon Area Public Library District in Lincolnshire, Illinois. Without further ado, thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you so much for having me. Um, okay, so I think we could just sort of jump right in. Um, I'm going to be sharing my screen right now. Let's see. Thank you all so very, very much for coming and everything and just um, being willing to hear a little bit more about my family's history and about the history of thousands of other people who experienced this. Um, before we start, I want to talk a little bit about the terminology I'll be using today. Um, you might have heard words like internment, evacuation, and relocation used to describe this part of our nation's history. And the problem is with these words is that they, they fail to really describe what happened to Japanese Americans during World War II. The government used euphemisms like these to describe their in inexcusable actions. And they did so fully aware of how misleading that language was. Language is powerful, and it's often used by those in power to distort and minimize the experience of marginalized communities. We see it today, and it was definitely the case in the 1940s. So evacuation and relocation, they sort of sound like something that's done as a precaution. Uh, something that you might view as a safety precaution before a natural disaster, rather than what actually happened, which was a targeted forced removal by soldiers with the threat of jail time if you did not comply. And the word internment actually refers to the detention of, quote, enemy aliens in a time of war. Now, the people who were put in these camps were not enemies, and the term aliens is dehumanizing. These were real people that this happened to families and children, and calling them internment camps is also misleading because the vast majority of the Japanese American community in the United States were U.S. citizens. So these decades old terms are still around, which means that most Americans learn about this event through a distorted lens that diminishes the harsh realities that faced my family and all of these other folks too. 
Um, in the words of Japanese American activist Aiko Herzig Yoshinaga, quote, words can lie or clarify. When we use language that distorts the past, we lose our ability to recognize when history repeats itself. But language that imparts truth and understanding can help us avoid repeating the same mistakes today. So instead of evacuate, evacuation, I will say force removal. And instead of relocation or internment camps, you'll hear me say incarceration camps because you deserve to hear the truth. So my grandmother and other relatives have been talking about camp for as long as I can remember. Uh, this is a photograph of my grandmother, who, Kay, who is in orange, uh, my grandpa Jerry in red, and then one of my aunties at a family gathering. Um, and, you know, when I was very young, a lot of the more complicated details of my family's history were, were left out. As relatives told me stories of the mess halls and the barracks and the dusty dirt roads, for the longest time, I honestly thought they were talking about a sleepaway camp, you know, someplace you'd go for six weeks and then come back home, like I did in my childhood. But it wasn't until I was older that I came to understand what my relatives' childhoods truly looked like. It boggled my mind how a country like ours, the land of the free and the home of the brave, would incarcerate its own citizens without trial and without due process. Especially when you consider the fact that in spite of the many accusations of espionage and sabotage, not a single person of Japanese descent was ever prosecuted or proven guilty of either. But back to my family. Um, my grandmother, Kay, uh, was nine when she was taken from Salinas, California, and my grandfather, Jerry, was 16 when his family was removed from Sacramento. Um, these are a couple of photographs that we have of my grandparents when they were in camp. We don't have too many of these, so these are very special images to my family. Um, my grandmother here is standing with a couple of her girlfriends at the Post and Incarceration Center in Arizona. Um, and I'm sure, I'm sure some of you might recognize the outfit that she's wearing in this photograph. She is actually standing with her Girl Scout troop. And we'll see a little bit later that there were thriving chapters of the American Boy Scouts and the American Girl Scouts in camp. Um, and the photograph of my grandfather over here um, on the right hand side is my grandfather and then two of his brothers standing in front of his family's uh, barrack in Jerome incarceration camp in Arkansas. And another uh, family photograph that I really enjoy sharing is, is this one. Uh, this is a photograph of the barber shop that my grandfather's family owned before the war. And this is a photograph that I like to show because it demonstrates that even though my grandparents were very, very young, they and their families led full lives before the war began. You know, that this, this happened to, to real people, to sons and daughters, parents, neighbors, business owners, next door neighbors. So tonight, we'll explore the realities of everyday life experienced by over 120,000 Japanese Americans and their or, excuse me, imprisoned in the incarceration camps. And while many people see this as a story of fear and loss, it would be impossible to ignore the hope and perseverance that blossomed in the deserts and the swamps of the camps. And despite the fact that their dignity that their basic human rights were taken away to supposedly protect the populace, detainees were still able to maintain a sense of identity, raise families, and find purpose. But before we go into all of that, we first have to see how these camps came into existence. When describing the aftermath of Pearl Harbor, one Japanese American uh, remembered back when he was, a, he was a young elementary school student when this happened, he said, it was as if the world fell about our ears. Everything had been turned upside down in an instant. The morning of Sunday, December 7th, 1941 was a, a quiet one for Yoshiko Uchida and her family. So here we have Yoshiko uh, standing with her father, her mother, and an aunt in front of their family's church in Berkeley, California. Now the family was always very sociable and they wouldn't be having visitors for lunch on that Sunday, which, which was unusual, but Yoshiko was grateful nonetheless. She was just four months shy of graduating from Berkeley and she was anxious to spend the afternoon studying for her exams and, and prepping to get ahead for the next semester. 
As she sat down to eat with her family, the pressing voice of a radio news anchor rang throughout their small California kitchen. That morning, he announced, Pearl Harbor had been attacked by Japanese fighter pilots. From across the table, Yoshiko saw her mother's face twist in shock, and her father, a local businessman, rose from the table and turned up the volume so he could hear the story more clearly. As the anchor continued with his report, the Uchida sat in silent disbelief. Her father, in an attempt to remain optimistic, smiled and, and shook his head. He assured his wife and daughter, this is only the work of a fanatic, he said. We have nothing to worry about. And it never for a moment occurred to anyone at that kitchen table that this would be the beginning of America's involvement in World War II, or that they would all be stripped of their civil rights in the months that followed. And so on February 19th, 1942, a mere 10 weeks after the attacks on Pearl Harbor, President Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066. This document is a, is a very, very heavy one uh, when it comes to my family history. So this order put the Secretary of War and his commanders in charge of establishing guarded military zones. So you could see over here on this map, the guarded military zones are these darker orange areas that take up Southern Arizona, the entire state of California, and Western Oregon and Washington. Now the military was given power to impose restrictions on anyone it deemed a threat. And all of this, this order uh, gave the military power to do so without hearings, without trials, and without any sort of due process. And while no specific races or ethnic groups were mentioned in the executive order, it became very clear who they were targeting. And soon posters like these were hung in towns all over the West Coast. Uh, my grandfather told me that he remembered seeing these posters uh, put up on the street where his family's barber shop was. Now, the regulations from the military came very, very swiftly. First, everyone of Japanese descent living in military zones had to register at designated government offices. And then the government imposed curfews, and soldiers began patrolling the streets of predominantly Japanese American neighborhoods in the evening and early morning. To do all of this, the government created the War Relocation Authority, uh, it's an organization I'll refer to as the WRA occasionally in this presentation. And they were to take charge of organizing, registering, and eventually removing Japanese Americans. And their very first job was to start the process of informing Japanese Americans that they would have to leave their homes by force if necessary. So my grandmother remembers, and my grandmother has this really incredible memory, but anytime she talks about the camps, she always would tell me and my sister and my cousins, we could only take what we could carry. This wouldn't be a lot, maybe one or two suitcases, a large trunk at most, and that's not a lot of space, especially when you consider that the government would be providing very little for folks in the incarceration camps. The families were required to bring a lot of their own supplies. Um, and this is an excerpt from Civilian Order Number 5, which outlined um, items that families had to bring with them to these incarceration camps. So you can see, this is just a partial list, uh, you could see that um, they had to bring bedding and linens for every member of the family, and no mattresses, and we'll see why in a moment, uh, toiletries, extra clothing, plates, cutlery for every member of the family, and if there was any room, any personal effects that you might have. But even with this list, how do you begin packing for a journey when you don't know where you'll be going or how long you'll be gone? What made the forced removal so frightening is that families didn't know what the government was going to do with them. Were, were they going to jail? Would they be deported? At the time, it was actually against the law for Asian immigrants to apply for naturalization, no, long, no matter how long they had been in the country. So some feared that elderly relatives like my great grandparents, who had been in the United States for many, many years, would be, who, who did not have citizenship, would be deported at a moment's notice. And again, confusion and misinformation just bound it because there was no due process. There was no real organized way to inform the Japanese American community of what exactly was going to be happening. So when the process began on March 22nd, 
1942 newsreels like this one called Out They Go announced its start with a tone wavering between fear and contempt. And not only does this newsreel never once mention that two thirds of those being forcibly removed were United States citizens, but it also uses a racial slur to describe them. Japs evacuate vital West Coast areas for the national security. At Los Angeles, 36,000 Japs see the handwriting on the wall and sell out their goods before their voluntary departure. So evacuation was not voluntary. It was absolutely the law. Families had very little time to prepare. Uh, lucky folks got a few weeks notice, others just a few days. As a result, they were forced to sell their homes and their property at a fraction of their true worth, and many were easily cheated out of their possessions or faced financial ruin. Um, one particularly infuriating example that I came across in my research was a woman in Southern California who was forced to sell her 26-room hotel for $500. And unfortunately, um, this, this was the case for a lot of people. And um, I remember my grandmother had talked about a neighbor who was trying to sell their house. They really couldn't. And someone who did come to offer to sell, to buy their house gave an infuriating Lilo price. And at first the neighbors refused to sell, but then the buyer came back and said, well, you don't have to buy right now, or you, sorry, you don't have to take my money, but once you're gone, what's to stop me from taking this house? So really it's be in your best interest if you take this money right now. And unfortunately that was a story for many, many families um, who were put into these incarceration camps. Now, Farms and homes and businesses were abandoned by those who couldn't or wouldn't sell, locked up in hopes that after the war, they could return home. So, and this is a picture of a storefront in San Francisco um, of stores, you know, sort of being boarded up and things. Now, hearing all of that is this question. Plenty of people have asked. I know I asked dozens of times when I was a teenager first really coming to terms and understanding what happened to my grandparents. Where was the outrage? Where was the anger from outside or from within the Japanese American community? Why on earth would you cooperate with forced removal when it was such a clear violation of your civil rights? Well, in part, I learned it was because there was nothing that they could do to stop it. Prejudice against Japanese Americans had been around long before the start of World War II. And this happened at a time when segregation was the law of the land. So as minorities, they had very little say in local, let alone federal government. And those who did not cooperate were arrested on federal charges. The powerful politicians and political groups like the Native Sons of the Golden West lobbied for mass incarceration. The government was very deliberate in how information about the camps was being shared, if at all. And remember, without social media like Twitter, TikTok, Facebook, regular folks couldn't connect and share information the same way that we can today. Lies and misinformation about Japanese Americans spread like wildfire, compounded with the existing racial prejudice already so ingrained in American culture, many people bought into this notion of sneaky, slanted-eyed people just coming in waves and droves who couldn't possibly be loyal to America, that their true allegiance could only lay elsewhere because they were so different. But were they that different? After Pearl Harbor, suspicions against Japanese Americans were at an all-time high, and many Japanese Americans were afraid that protesting would make them appear more suspicious to their non-Asian neighbors. So it was really encouraged within the Japanese American community to cooperate with the government as, as much as you possibly could. There was this idea that by leaving quietly and calmly, you would be demonstrating your civic duty, show your patriotism, and you would prove that you had nothing to hide. I didn't really understand this point of view when I was younger. Um, I kind of saw it as a passive act, and I'm sure lots of other people have as well, but this attitude actually largely comes from a Buddhist practice called gaman. So gaman is demonstrating strength 
in the face of difficulty and suffering. It's this idea of calling on something inside of yourself to endure the unbearable with patience and with dignity. It was an outlook that meant to help families cope and deal with circumstances that were beyond their control. That being said, many people took extra steps to protect their families as much as they could before the forced removal. In the rush of sorting clothes and shoes and supplies for the, the relocation, my grandmother remembers her mother burning letters and pictures of relatives still living in Japan. The photos were all completely harmless. Images of distant cousins, grandparents, pets, graduation, home life. But my great-grandmother was terrified that the soldiers who would come into her home would somehow see these letters with Japanese writing and Japanese faces on them and that they would interpret them as a sign of treason. And so as a result, she, she burned them. She wanted to do everything she could to protect her children. And my family lost countless photos and heirlooms throughout this process and many other families did the same. And Unfortunately, future generations, including myself, suffered this, this tremendous loss. Those are images, those are letters that we can't get back. Now soon, families were counted and numbered and tagged. The forced removal or evacuation was carried out in several stages. First, if you lived in more rural areas of the West Coast, you were transported by cattle trucks or buses. And in larger, more urban areas, like where my grandparents were, trains to assembly centers where they were organized before being sent off to the larger incarceration camps. And these assembly centers were held in old fairgrounds and racetracks. The army very quickly built barracks and hastily cleared horse stalls of waste because these were going to be repurposed as housing for families. Uh, my grandmother remembers arriving by bus at the gate of the Santa Anita racetrack, which was the largest of the 17 assembly centers around three o'clock in the morning. Again, she was nine years old. She said, all I remember after getting off those hot trains and buses, we had to keep the curtains closed so no one would see there was a bunch of Japanese in there, is all these people. I had never seen so many Japanese people in one place until I got to Santa Anita. I saw the stables and barracks, and I thought, this is home? But not for long. Within a few weeks, families gathered their belongings once more and boarded trains and buses for the camps, officially known as relocation centers or internment camps. Now, people were detained in 10 camps that were run by the War Relocation Authority in very isolated areas of the country from May of 1942 to as late as 1946 after the war had officially ended. Uh, my grandmother from Santa Anita traveled down here to Poston, Arizona, which is right on the border of Southern California and Arizona. My grandfather's journey is a little bit more complicated. Um, his family was actually moved around several times. First, his family was sent up to Northern California to Tule Lake. And then after about a year or so, and after a particular government survey, um, his family was transferred all the way down here to Jerome, Arkansas. This was the furthest east that anybody on that side of the family had ever been before. It was definitely a culture shock for them. Um, within another year and year or year and a half, um, Jerome was closed to become a prisoner of war camp and his family was uprooted once more and they were transferred to the Gila River incarceration camp in Southern Arizona. So a lot of, a lot of bouncing back and forth. So after days of traveling, many Japanese Americans, they, they looked forward to getting off the trains and stretching their legs. And initially they were comforted by the idea that these centers were run by the government. Because surely after all of their cooperation, they would be well taken care of. And unfortunately, you, you can see here, yeah, and I believe you can imagine their shock when they arrived in the dusty deserts and in the swamplands of the camps. Um, this is a photograph of Heart Mountain Incarceration Camp in Wyoming. Um, and you could see there's really nothing for miles. You can sort of see the barracks that are, are lined up here and then way out in the distance, um, you could see the barbed wire fence. 
So there, there really was nothing around these camps. Uh, the shock was compounded by the fact that when detainees began arriving, many of the camp's facilities weren't quite ready for them yet. Sewage systems, schools, and barracks for housing well, weren't completed or hadn't been built yet. Uh, initially, the government and War Relocation Authority didn't want to waste time and resources on luxuries like schools. The camps were considered temporary communities. But as it became clear that folks would be living in these facilities long term, Japanese Americans were expected to finish constructing the camps themselves. It was an unsettling experience and it was humiliating. Defining themselves surrounded by barbed wire and guard towers, many internees' first impressions became their most vivid memories. Um, I'm going to ask you to remember that uh, the list, partial list from civilian order number five, where the government told families that they had to bring bedding and linen for each member of the family, but no mattresses. Well, for Norman Mineta, who later grew up to work under President Bush Sr. and President Clinton as a cabinet member, his first memory of camp was making his own mattress out of straw. Um, this was actually something that both of my grandparents had experienced as well. Um, and what my family had told me is that each member of the family was given a large canvas sack and they were told to go towards, you know, one portion of, um, of the camp where there were these just large, large, huge piles of hay and of straw. And you had to quite literally make your bed and everything. Um, my, my uncle Tatsu would always sort of joke about, you know, the, uh, it gives a whole meaning to the term making a bed and everything, but it's just, if you can imagine, this is one of your first experiences in your new home, it's, it's really sort of jarring and shocking. Um, in this next interview that I wanna share with you, uh, actor and activist George Takei describes adjusting to his new surroundings at the Rower Relocation Center in Arkansas as a five-year-old. Um, I, I enjoy sharing this interview because it gives you an idea of how strange and, and foreign these parts of the country were to detainees, especially young children like George, who had spent his entire life in, in Southern California. We got to get a view of the area they were all black tar paper barracks. Um, there was, the um, mess hall was in the center and the um, uh, barracks were lined up uh, beside the mess hall. And uh, beyond the mess hall, uh, beyond the uh, barracks was a barbed wire fence. And beyond that was a dense, lush, uh, swampy uh, woods. And uh, there were sounds coming from the woods. It was very exotic, uh, calling sounds and screeching sounds. And I remember my father telling us about uh, um, jungles and, and, and uh, some of the creatures that lived in the jungles. But there was a kid there who uh, told us that there were dinosaurs living out there in the swamps and that those were dinosaur sounds. And so that's when I first found out about these prehistoric beasts uh, uh, living out there. But, uh, and they sounded scary. But uh, the kid told me that we didn't have to worry because the barbed wire fence would uh, keep them out. We were safe. I've worked with children for a long time. There's always one. <laughs> There's always at least one. Um, so that, again, this kind of shows you the idea of just, just how strange this whole experience was in the mind of a child. And that, that last line that Mr. Takei says, you know, the barbed wire fence will keep them out. We will be safe. Is actually something many internees had heard, of course, not in reference to dinosaurs. Um, my grandfather, who had grown up going to American schools, um, you know, in high schools and things, and many other young people in the camps, they, they sort of looked around and they would, they would ask government officials and they asked their elders, why are we being put into these camps? What is, what is the whole point of all of this? And 
the response that the Japanese American community got from the government by and large sounded something a little bit like this. Um, what, what Japanese Americans had heard was, well, here's the thing. There are a lot of people who are very angry at you right now. A lot of people who blame you for what happened in Pearl Harbor because you happen to look like the people who did it. And we want to make sure that you all stay safe. So that's why we, we're having you leave your homes. We're putting you inside of these facilities to keep, to keep all the bad guys out there, to keep you safe inside these camps. And my grandfather and other young people would sort of look around and go, well, if the bad guys are out there, why does the barbed wire fence curl inwards towards us? And why do the guards in their guard towers with their guns patrol the inside of the camp perimeter instead of outside of the camp. Something that my, my grandfather thought about a lot. My grandmother remembers with this really incredible clarity, the barracks that she and thousands of others were to call home for the next several years. She told me in an interview, I still remember exactly where we lived in camp. Block 213, barrack number four. They put all eight of us, my two parents and six children in a tiny room, I think about 20 by 25 feet. The building was only made of wood planks hammered together and the outside walls had tar paper covering them. Our barracks were made in such a hurry that you could see the gaps in between the planks when you moved in. The heat, eventually, or excuse me, remember she lived in the Arizona desert. The heat eventually made the board shrink. And I think the gaps got to be maybe one or two inches wide in some places. The gaps in the floor were really bad. We would have to check our shoes in the morning for sand or scorpions that went into them in the middle of the night. So as you can see, barracks offered virtually no privacy. Each family was assigned a single room apartment within a barrack. And if you were by yourself or had a small family, you often had to share your apartment with strangers. Now each barracks apartment didn't have toilets or running water, so residents would have to use communal bathrooms, which at first always didn't have running water either. And my grandmother remembers having to walk two blocks to the bathrooms in the middle of the night as a young girl. Um, now, when you're envisioning, you know, these sort of washing facilities, I want you to imagine just one long empty barrack with several rows of toilets and a row of exposed shower heads. Um, on the slide here, you can see this is actually an illustration uh, by Mine Okubo, who was a former um, internee herself, just sort of drawing out what the washroom facilities looked like. And then these two photographs um, that you see on the lower part of the slide are actually recreations um, of the man's in our um, incarceration camp. Um, very interesting fact is that uh, Manzanar has actually been made into a national park and historic site. So if you were ever in Southern California, you could visit and you could take tours of reconstructed facilities, or you could visit their digital archives and take a virtual tour as well. I highly, highly recommend that. Um, but again, this is not exactly a place you would want to start your day. Uh, Yoshiko Uchida, who we met earlier when her family heard the radio announcement for Pearl Harbor, said the lack of privacy in the toilets and showers were an embarrassing hardship, particularly for older women. She said many would take newspapers to hold over their faces as they entered. They were so embarrassed. And as you can see um, in Mine Okubo's illustration, families sort of band together and they would uh, donate sheets and fabric to create privacy curtains. Now, despite the meager living conditions and the starkness of the barracks, Japanese Americans, they worked very hard to create some sense of comfort in their new homes. Um, like with the washing facilities, they used sheets to make partitions within the apartments. They would build furniture from scraps of wood left over from construction sites, an example of which you can actually see in the right-hand photograph. Um, all the way on the right-hand side right here, this night table is just made from a few leftover wood planks um, hammered together. Now, when you walked into your apartment for the very first time, it was very stark. Um, you could see the, the exposed walls um, and all that was in the room were metal bed frames, 
some sort of a, a heating element, either a coal or a wood burning stove, which you can see here for heat. And that was it. Um, so you can see that there's this uh, photograph of a group of cousins here trying to decorate their, their apartment as much as they can. And they're, they're actually using their own handkerchiefs to create curtains for their windows because that, that was not something that was provided for folks. And this is another example of a, a single apartment um, within a barrack. You can sort of see too up here at the very top, the angled roofs um, didn't always have walls that came up and met with them all the way. So sometimes occasionally in apartments, you would have a large triangle of space that sound and all sorts of other things could travel to through, not terribly private. As I mentioned before, barracks didn't have running water or cooking stoves, so meals all came from a communal mess hall. Now, the mess halls were too small to serve everybody at the same time, so each family was put on a schedule. And to this day, again, my grandmother incredibly remembers what her family's schedule was. For her, breakfast was served at 7 a.m., lunch was at noon, and dinner was at 6 p.m. And if you happen to miss your shift, you better hope that you've had some non-perishables back in your barrack. Because if you, if you missed your shift, that was it. You would have to wait till the next meal. Residents, as a result, residents would wait in long lines, rain or shine, to enter the mess hall until other families finished their meals. And you can see here, you know, everybody is sort of waiting outside and these women are holding sort of bundles. You know, well, what could they possibly be carrying with them? Um, again, I'm going to ask you to, to sort of harken back to civilian order number five. Um, the government didn't supply flatware or plates for the internees, so they would have to bring their own plates, cups, spoons, forks, knives, everything with them to and from every single meal and wash those dishes in kind of large communal water troughs as well. Um, so you could see these women, they're carrying all of their, um, their flatware and everything in these bundles to not only make it convenient, but also to protect those plates from the elements as they were waiting outside as well. Now incarceration was hard on everybody, but for young children, their world was turned completely upside down. Everything from where they slept to the food on their plates was completely different. Um, what was on the menu? Well, they were fed government commodity foods like and cast off meat uh, from army surplus. So things like hot dogs, ketchup, kidney beans, potatoes, and spam. Uh, my grandmother and grandfather were introduced to spam in the camps and I can guarantee you there's at least one tin in her cabinet at home in Bolingbrook right now. Um, but as you can imagine, the Japanese diet and family table were, were virtually erased. And for, for many, many families, food is a way of sharing love and culture. And when that is taken away from you, that leaves a very big hole. Um, and as, as another side note, my grandmother remembers one particularly memorable dessert that was served to her in camp was um, a scoop of rice topped with a scoop of canned peaches. Not exactly comfort food. Uh, the mess halls, they also, they impacted families um, in very unanticipated ways as well. Uh, in this next interview, we're going to listen to Kaz Fujishima as she recalls how the mess halls really affected her family. As a matter of fact, when we went into camp, um, there was a separation in families and I do feel that my father did not have control of our, of us as much as he did uh, on the outside. And so life was much easier for us girls, <laughs> I must say. So um, we were supposed to eat as a family unit, but uh, you would see that us teenagers all got together and ate together and uh, the parents would uh, sit with their friends and eat together with them. So the family unit was broken, actually, when we went into camps. In the chaos of the dining hall, families no longer ate together. The family table, with its traditions and conversations, slowly began to fade. And in many cases, families, some families in camp never really recovered from this. 
Okay, so we talked about we talked about the barracks and the food. What was day to day life like in these incarceration camps? Well, work was very important for a lot of folks. Uh, now you didn't have to work; you weren't forced to work in the camps, but most adults actually wanted to. Jobs were a way to pass time and a way for folks to feel a sense of self worth. It was also a way to earn money for their families, still looking ahead as always, albeit the pay was low. Um, and unfortunately, there weren't nearly enough jobs to go around. So what was available? Because the War Relocation Authority wanted camps to be as self-sufficient as possible, most jobs involved physical labor to keep the camps up and running. Um, you could see examples of this in these two photographs here. Both of these um, are from the post-incarceration camp. Um, the photograph on the right-hand side are of gentlemen who are actually taking adobe clay from the desert and fashioning them into bricks to dry out in the sun. And on the left-hand side, you can see uh, these folks who are laying bricks to build the facade of the school that their children would be attending. Uh, my great-grandfather on my grandmother's side was actually a carpenter before the war. Uh, so when he arrived in camp, he was hired right away to help build the barracks and schools and mess halls. Other folks worked as farm laborers. Every single camp operated farms and crops were often exchanged between camps. Again, the, the government wanted these camps to be very self-sufficient. Um, but they were these were very hard jobs. These were 48 hour work weeks out in the hot sun and some other jobs were, um, you could also work in warehouses to keep shipments of food and supplies in order for detainees and for the military who were stationed in these camps. Like I said before, pay, pay was low. Um, jobs like these paid about $12 a month. And if you adjust that for inflation, that is about $195 today. If you happen to be a doctor or a nurse before the war, you could work in a camp run hospital for $19 a month. A little bit better, but still a bit insulting when you consider the fact that white nurses employed at these hospitals were paid $200 a month. Now, though the camps provided detainees with very basic medical and dental care, conditions were less than ideal. You could see here, this is a photograph of um, a doctor working with a patient at the Manzanar incarceration camp in Southern California. Um, and qualified staff, unfortunately, were very, very hard to come by in the camps and uh, medical supply shortages were also very, very common. Now, some jobs, went to the war effort. Um, this is a photograph that was taken uh, by Ansel Adams of a few women who are actually working on camouflage nets for the United States Army to use. Um, and folks were, th these sorts of jobs were very much coveted. Um, and folks, they really wanted to help. They wanted to aid in the war effort as much as they possibly could, even though they were behind barbed wire. And there were some folks who wanted to go a step further and they wanted to serve. Now that topic could cover an entire an entire lecture, um, but I'll just touch on just a little bit of that here. Um, and also, I, I believe I forgot to mention to Renee as well, I'm going to have a resource sheet available. Um, so I will send a PDF of that to her. So you all will be able to read and watch a few documentaries about all of this if you're interested. Um, as I said, there were some folks who wanted to serve in the military. They wanted to aid in the war effort, but the government unfortunately refused to give folks this chance. In fact, in January of 1942, any Japanese Americans who were already in the military were discharged and reclassified as enemy aliens. You can imagine many were heartbroken by this, but they pressed on. Those who were discharged petitioned the military to reinstate them. And one of the many letters that was sent in um, read as follows. The United States is our country. We know but one loyalty and that is to the stars and stripes. We wish to do our part as loyal Americans in every way possible and hereby offer ourselves for whatever service you may see fit to use us. After receiving countless letters and petitions like this one in 1943, the army created a segregated all Japanese American unit called the 442nd Regimental Combat Team. 
the men of the 442nd felt they needed to prove their allegiance and show everyone back at home that they were true Americans inside and out. And this team went on to fight with uncommon distinction in Italy, Germany, and France, where the 442nd became best known for rescuing the lost battalion in the Vosges Mountains. Over 14,000 men volunteered or were drafted into the 442nd, and by the end of the war, it became the most decorated unit for its size and its length of service. So you could see some of the accolades um, of this group, and you can also see the seal of the 442nd, and their motto was, go for broke. Give it everything that you possibly could. Now, what I find most incredible about all of these young men is that while they were fighting overseas, while they were sacrificing themselves, their families were still behind barbed wire, imprisoned by their own country. These men were not only fighting for America's freedom, but for their families, because they knew that ending the war also meant ending the incarceration camps. And speaking of their families, we're gonna head back to the home front and talk about something that their young children experienced almost every single day in camp, and that was school. Now the schools were hastily cobbled together and the government designed curriculum was meant to keep students occupied, out of trouble, and educated about American customs. Never mind the fact that almost all of these children had grown up going to American schools, elementary schools, high schools. So that sentiment alone really tells you what the government thought of the children that were being imprisoned in these camps. So what did classrooms behind barbed wire look like? Well, to say that the schools were ill-prepared would be kind. The class sizes were immense. For example, at the height of attendance, rower schools had 2,339 students with only 45 certified teachers. That averages about to uh, 51 pupils per instructor. Camp schools didn't always have enough supplies, books, or even furniture for their students. As some families were left building makeshift benches or chairs from scrap lumber left over from construction workers so their children wouldn't have to kneel or sit on the dusty floors. And this was something that my grandmother did. She would carry a small chair with her a few blocks to and from school every single day so she would have a place to sit. Now, my grandfather remembers attending Denson High School in Jerome, Arkansas, which he actually graduated from. That's him highlighted in the orange there. Um, and he told me in, in an interview, we went to school over there and there was nothing ready that first year. No books, no pencils to write, no paper. And they tell you, you got to go to school. So we just sat down and you listen to them talk, you know, or they would read a book and you got to listen to what they said. There was no homework whatsoever at first because there weren't enough books to go around. And now a, a small detail that I would like to um, bring to your attention is that you could see here, so uh, my grandfather's name was Iwao, uh, he went by Jerry. You could see here Iwao Nakayama um, and included in, in these sort of descriptions would be any sort of extracurricular activities students were involved with, but they would also include the name of the high school that you would have graduated from had you not been in camp. So you could see here, my grandfather would have graduated from Sacramento High School in Sacramento, California. Now government officials, they attempted to convince students that these conditions would help build character, it would make them stronger. Uh, one administrator noted in a memo, quote, adversity is often a challenge to the best qualities of human nature. There were folks in the government who genuinely believed that they were giving Japanese Americans an opportunity to perform their civic duty by doing more with less, but this much less? For many of the younger internees, including my grandmother, they were generally shielded from the hardships of camp life because of their innocence. But high schoolers who were older and much more aware of their situation were very deeply impact, impacted. 
they saw the contradiction between what they learned in school about democracy and what they saw in their daily lives, filled with guard towers, barbed wire that surrounded their makeshift classrooms. And for many, the experience left open emotional wounds that would shape their opinions about the world and what they could accomplish in it long after they had left camp. But, come on, we have to do the best with what we can. Despite being torn from their homes and the hardships that they now faced, there was still a glimmer of hope among many of these Japanese Americans living in these incarceration camps. And they, they pressed on, they moved forward, they found ways to give themselves meaning and follow their passions, even when they were in camp. And they created community organizations, clubs, and sports teams. Uh, this is a picture of a baseball team at the Minidoka incarceration camp. And there were also, there were, if sports weren't necessarily your thing too, there were glee clubs, student council, literary magazines, Spanish clubs, and as I had mentioned previously, thriving chapters of the American Boy and Girl Scouts. Um, what's really most interesting is that First of all, I just want to say I really enjoy looking at all these pictures of, of young people inside of these camps. Uh, this is a, a picture, um, in fact, of a couple of high school and kind of college age students who um, pushed a bunch of tables out of the way in the mess hall and they created a place where they could just have a dance. And if you look at you know these photographs, you see you see kids in saddle shoes. You see folks wearing you know their varsity Letterman jackets and things and bobby socks, um, and they look like your average American teenager. And it's not until you sort of look into the background when you see sort of the exposed walls of the barracks, when you see the guard towers. Um, around the perimeters of the camps that you realize this isn't exactly your average American childhood or teenage experience. Now, it's important to note that none of these organizations received any sort of financial support from the War Relocation Authority. Um, any sort of, you know, uniforms, sporting equipment, supplies, um, that they needed, Japanese Americans would have to buy and pay for on their own, or in some cases, they became very resourceful and made them. Um, some of you actually might, might recognize what this is right away. This is actually meant to be home base. Um, and this is an artifact from the Manzanar um, Incarceration Center. This is actually in their uh, facilities museum. And this was this was made from a piece of leftover scrap wood um, from a construction site when they were sort of redoing the outside of the barracks. So you could see, you could still see the nail holes, the rusty nail holes um, at the top and at the bottom of this home base because that, as my, my grandfather once told me, you, you couldn't take baseball away from us. Because cheering for their families and friends on the sidelines, sports and other activities made them feel normal for a little while, even if it was just for one inning, just one period. Any moment that you could forget about the guard towers and barbed wire was a good one. And if sports, as I said, weren't necessarily your thing, that was a okay. The, the one interesting thing about having so many people concentrated in such a small area is that you had dozens and dozens of different skill sets that people brought with them into camp. And so if folks wanted to teach classes, you were guaranteed to have all those seats filled very, very quickly. So volunteers taught a wide variety of classes. Um, this is Ikebana. This is a flower arranging class at the post and incarceration camp. This is a dressmaking class at Manzanar. Uh, my grandmother actually uh, said that she first learned how to sew when she was in camp, which is something that came in very useful for her because she later grew up to be a seamstress. And despite their bleak surroundings, art and artists thrived in the camps. Um, these pieces of artwork are some of the best images that we have of camp life on a very, very intimate level. This is this is probably one of my favorite pieces that I've come across in my research uh, for, for a couple of reasons. Um, one, this is a post in Arizona, which is where my grandmother, you know, spent several, several years. Um, the composition is also really beautiful too, very clear blues, you know, beautiful, warm, round, or warm um, brown tones. Um, 
But what I love about this painting so much is what was used to make it. You can sort of see about two thirds of the way through this painting, there's this sort of shadow running across it. Um, that's because this painting was made on a piece of leftover cardboard from a mess hall. So again, this, this idea of taking whatever you have and making the most of it, making it into something beautiful. And if, if this isn't an example of that, I'm, I don't know what is. The folks also did their best to really celebrate the everyday simple pleasures um, as much as they could as well. Uh, this is a photograph of Hart Mountain, which was in Wyoming, and it got incredibly cold up there. Um, and with permission from, you know, from the, the soldiers and from the guards, what internees would do is they would take fire hoses and they would spray these wide tracts of land um, to create ice rinks. And as far as where they got the ice skates from, um, it's a very, very long story um, involving lots of letters and lots of surrounding communities sort of kind of donating the skates and things. Um, but, you know, this led to, again, it's probably another one of my, my favorite images that I've come across in my research that doesn't come from my family's archives. Um, you see this father who is teaching his little boy how to skate. And, um, and I, I have a nephew about the same age as, as this little boy too. So I'm just, I'm imagining, you know, holding on to his hands so very, very tightly, trying to make sure that he doesn't fall and everything. The little boy and the father are both probably giggling in that picture. And it's, it's a very bittersweet image for me because as, as much joy as there is in that picture, I can't help but wonder what this father might be thinking at night after he's tucked his little boy into bed, after his little boy has fallen asleep. And he could be wondering to himself, what kind of future will I be able to give my son? Will he, will he be able to graduate from high school? Can he go to college? Will he find a job? Will he be able to have a family of his own? All of these things were so uncertain for young families and young parents. Now, luckily for this particular family, they didn't have to wait terribly long to find out what would happen. In December of 1944, the government passed a proclamation declaring that camps would begin to close in January 1945. And families began registering for leave passes like these. Um, these were very important documents that you had to have on your person after you left camp. Um, it was very, very important that you had them with you because they proved to local authorities, to other folks who wanted to see your ID, that you were cleared by the government, that you were considered safe, that you were authorized, um, in, in Ralph's case here, to be in Chicago, and that it was okay for you to be there. So people carried these documents with them for a very long time after they left camp. Now, after they were released, some families did attempt to return to the West Coast and rebuild their lives. And while several folks had, had kind neighbors who guarded their property, ran their businesses, many others were surprised to find that their homes or farms and businesses were simply taken over or vandalized beyond repair. Uh, this is a photograph that was taken by Ansel Adams of a family returning to their house in Southern California after spending four years at the Manzanar Incarceration Center. And you can see, you can see the father, he's, he's doing the best he can to remain strong and put on a good face. But the mother's expression to me really says everything that you need to know about what's going on in this picture. Um, after the war, Oh, excuse me, fearing prejudice and violence back on the West Coast, the majority of detainees, they traveled eastward, which is exactly what my family did. Uh, my grandmother's family left for New Jersey to work for a large farm, and my grandfather's family settled in Chicago. After the war, the vast majority of Japanese Americans, they, they wanted to keep their profiles low. They didn't want to cause waves in the new communities, and many parents urged their children to refrain from saying that they were even Japanese for fear of persecution. Um, my mother remembers my grandmother telling her, you know, if, if somebody asks you if you're Japanese, either lie, lie, say that you're something else, change the subject or leave because you don't know why they are asking you. And my grandmother also really discouraged uh, my family from speaking Japanese outside of the house because 
again, my grandmother was terrified that somebody could hear my mother or my aunt speaking in Japanese on the L. Someone would hear them, someone wouldn't like it, and someone might act on it. Um, after decades of work um, by activists, so folks who were you know, about my mother's age and everything, when they had learned what had happened to their parents, they were absolutely infuriated because a lot of folks who had survived these camps didn't really want to talk about their experiences. And so many people weren't aware that this had happened. Um, but again, after decades of, of work by activists, in 1980, President Jimmy Carter was convinced to conduct an investigation to determine whether putting Japanese Americans into these incarceration camps was justified. Um, the investigation's report, called Personal Justice Denied, uh, determined that it was not. They were not justified well enough by the government and actually recommended that um, that the internees receive um, reparations, $20,000 worth of reparations to survivors. And yes, that sounds like a lot of money, but there were a lot of little hitches that kind of went along with this too. Um, the only people who could receive any sort of reparations were folks who were actually living in the camps. Um, and unfortunately, these sorts of payments didn't go into effect until the early 90s. And so you, you figure the folks who were most deeply impacted financially by all of this had already passed on by that point. Um, and also there's the fact as well that there's no amount of money that could give you four years of your life back. Um, what really, really made an impact for a lot of folks within the Japanese American community though, uh, were the formal apologies. Uh, that came afterwards. So in 1988, Ronald Reagan signed the Civil Liberties Act, which offered, again, a formal apology to former detainees. So these are two examples of letters, uh, one from George Bush, one from Bill Clinton, um, again, apologizing, formally apologizing for what the government had done to their families. And now, for many Japanese Americans, Calling their allegiance into question and the years of wrongful imprisonment left a devastating impact on their lives. It left deep wounds that shaped their views of the world and themselves long after the camps closed. And the impacts of internment are still felt within the Japanese American community today. Other detainees were no less aware of the racial injustice that created the camps, but they took the camps institutions and they made them their own despite being told that they were untrustworthy, unwanted, and un-American. They refused to let their circumstances or other people's prejudices define who they were, and they rose above these hardships, largely on their own. It didn't have to be this way. It doesn't have to be this way. We need to look out for each other. If there's anything that we could learn from all of this, it's, it's compassion, it's being aware, and it's being able to promise to ourselves, to them, that we can never let anything like this happen again, not on American soil, not anywhere, because we're better than that. And in my opinion, the kindness and the quiet strength and courage of my grandparents and other former detainees like them is truly what makes them American. Thank you very much.